As just one of many anomalous entities spoken of in the oral traditions of the Jordanian Bedouin, this entity in particular is described as having the appearance of a cyclops and a hoofed foot resembling that of a donkey or an ostrich. Many have testified to have seen this creature from a distance, while those who have even encountered it directly say it's invulnerable to bullets. According to local tribesmen, it goes by the name of Salewa and British explorers in the early 1900s who surveyed the area were warned about encountering this being. Even the problematic orientalist and adventurer Charles Montago Doughty in his influential 1888 travel log makes several references to this creature as something both native and terrifying to the area. Throughout history, reports have emerged detailing encounters with the enigmatic beings and time distortion anomalies tied to the locations where a large loss of life has occurred. In 1915, in Gallipoli, Turkey, in a conflict that would ultimately see more than 130 people unalived, multiple witnesses testified to seeing the 5th Norfolk Regiment from the UK march into a low-lying cloud and vanish into thin air. Their remains were later found on a farm scattered across an area of one square mile, some distance from where the anomaly was initially observed. Then in Syria, from 2011 and in the decade since, there have been several reports of encounters with spectral entities that have manifested in heavy conflict areas. Humanoid in general appearance, they're sometimes described as exhibiting extraordinary abilities, helping injured civilians to safety. Similar instances of luminous humanoid anomalies have been encountered in 2023 Gaza, Palestine, where at the time of this edit, nearly 25,000 people, most of whom are civilians, had lost their lives. Here, not only has the media reported on testimonies concerning the manifestation of beings composed of light comforting children trapped beneath building wreckage, but also members of the military have claimed to have had terrifying skirmishes with more malevolent entities often described as ghosts. Beyond the region, such occurrences have been reported in France 1914 during the Battle of Mons then decades later in Kashmir in 2005, Japan in 2011, following the Tohoku event, and Missouri, USA in 2012. While the majority of these encounters are benign in nature and at times even beneficial, what about other locations where anomalies have been overly malicious? In this episode, we'll look at two such locations one in Arok and the other in Jordan, where for decades there have been countless eyewitness accounts of terrifying entities known as shadow people, manifesting in cursed locations historically known for a high loss of life. This is Batn al Ghul, a mountain and valley area in the heart of Jordan. Some of the Bedouin here consider the location haunted and even evil. For hundreds of years, there have been reports of unusual phenomena occurring here, especially at night. Explorers and campers traveling through it have reported hearing knocks on windows and roofs of their cars by unseen entities while driving through the area. Others, speak of terrifying screams coming from an unidentified direction. And recently, 
One journalist working for the Jordanian media outlet Al Ra'i wrote that while exploring its valley, he was advised not to light a fire at night here as it will attract the attention of an unfriendly, invisible entity. Unfortunately for a team of US soldiers camped there in the 1980s, they learned of these horrors the hard way. The term Batn al Ghul translates to belly of the ghoul, or more forebodingly, the belly of the beast. Here, David Morehouse, a former US Army soldier stationed in the area during the 80s, recounts a harrowing story of when his squad were allegedly attacked by an army of spirits in this area. In his book, The Psychic Warrior, he states that for many years, Jordanian servicemen camped in the area have reported seeing shadow entities roaming the wasteland, and even in rare instances, attack people. The manifestations of these beings would typically occur after a nightfall, if a strange atmospheric phenomena that causes the entire valley to become bathed in a strange bluish-gray light is observed. According to Morehouse, one night after recovering from an accidental head injury, he would experience the phenomenon firsthand. Sometime in the night, my eyes opened to a surreal light outside the tent. It was like the light of an eclipsed sun and wasn't coming from any stove. It filled the night sky. The entire Bautana El Ghul and the hills beyond were bathed in the strange bluish gray light. I walked to the edge of the bluff and stared into the valley. Dark figures moved effortlessly across its floor, like apparitions. They poured from the rocks in various heaps and shapes and moved about the clusters of tents. I could hear muffled cries from the Jordanian encampment and momentarily I thought we were being overrun by thieves or Israelis. Panicked, I turned to run for help. Colliding with one of the figures, I reflexively closed my eyes, except I didn't collide. I walked right through it. Turning around, I watched the figure disappear over the edge of the bluff. How true the story is, is problematic. However, Morehouse does say that his head injury gave him abilities that now allows him to easily see these entities, even when others cannot. Consequently, he was assigned to Project Stargate, a program within the US government that dealt with weaponizing psychic abilities, namely remote viewing, as this was one of the paranormal abilities he developed following his accidents. Remote viewing is the ability to gather information about a distant or unseen target, often involving visualization or extrasensory perception using the mind. Officially discontinued in 1995, after 17 years of research, the decision to terminate the Stargate project was primarily based on a lack of evidence supporting the reliability and effectiveness of this type of intelligence gathering. Yet. In the three decades since, the project has remained a subject of interest and speculation, with some suggesting that classified research related to this phenomena continues under different names within different agencies globally. Now, while this is not directly relevant to the topic of haunted locations, it does play an indirect role concerning the origins of the Botnagul mystery that predates the US's involvement in Jordan by decades. But before we explain how, let's go back to the mid-2000s at Oak, where multiple encounters similar in nature to Morehouse's experience in Jordan have been reported. In a chilling account shared by a former US Army surgeon, now a government contractor and author who tracks anomalous encounters, wrote a number of eerie incidents that unfolded during deployment near Camp Babylon in Iraq. The veteran, who had just completed active duty and was in the process of leaving the military, found himself drawn into unexpected and paranormal events while stationed in the region. The author, who recounted this event in an online post, said the following. I was a sergeant in the U.S. Army when President Bush ordered more troops into Iraq in 2003. 
I had just returned home to Austin, Texas, when I was summoned into my local National Guard unit at Camp Mabry, and told that I was being recalled to the Army, but the unit was already tasked out to deploy to Iraq. I was not part of their unit yet, so the commander offered to give me a waiver to deploy with a government contractor, Halliburton, in Houston. I knew that I would make more money as a contractor, so I took the offer. Not long after arriving in Kuwait at Camp Doha, I began working with the operations team overseeing logistics affairs. We would oversee the daily convoy of supply between Kuwait and Baghdad, a route riddled with IED incidents, small arms skirmishes, and almost constant breakdowns of army and civilian vehicles. Because I was a saw gunner in the 1st Infantry Division while in active duty, and was technically still in the guard, I was often in the convoys manning a mounted weapon that accompanied the mostly civilian convoys. During these runs, we had a few strange encounters in an area south of Baghdad, known then as Camp Babylon. Occupied by French troops, but then designated an archaeological site for obvious reasons, Camp Babylon was set up in the area that was said to originally be inhabited by the famous Tower of Babel. Indeed, there were ruins there that did look like a massive structure once stood at that spot. I had two strange incidents happen to me while passing through there. The first incident seems a bit benign, but sets the mood for the second. We were passing through Camp Babylon in the afternoon one day, when our convoy took small arms fire. The standard operating procedure was to stop the convoy and return fire. While engineers looked for explosive devices on the road, we scanned the horizon for enemy. Nothing. They most likely fled immediately. However, the ruins around Camp Babylon were alive with shadow figures that seemed to move about the area. Several times we would spot the figures, but they would immediately disappear. A contractor lying beside me with his weapon commented, How odd that we are in the shadow of Babel and fighting the supernatural. I didn't feel, at the time, that much was supernatural, but certainly did see the shadowy and bizarrely small figures dart about the structures. The second incident occurred about a month later. At this point, the weather in southern Iraq and Kuwait had turned quite cold at night. During this encounter, we had just completed the supply run to Baghdad and were returning back to Camp Doha in Kuwait when a vehicle in our convoy broke down. Once again, we found ourselves right at Camp Babylon. While the army mechanics took a look at the vehicle, and the rest of us took up fighting positions around the area, strange things began to occur. It started with a strange light bobbing in the desert. Thinking it was a person with a flashlight, we used NVGs, or night vision goggles, to watch. It was simply a glowing ball of light moving towards a set of ruins. After initial contact with the light, a few of us had moved forward away from the convoy to see what the source was. After seeing it was self-contained and not a person, we were a bit alarmed. Then we heard a sound that I will never forget. A long wailing began from one of the ruined structure's foundations not far away. It sounded like a woman in agony, mixed with loneliness. On and on the sounds went while we huddled in the cold and dark, wondering what the hell we were listening to. With our NVGs equipped, we used our flashlights to spotlight the ruins. If you've ever done this, you will know that a normal flashlight with NVGs looks like a massive beam of light. We scoured the area, but no source of the whales or the ball of light were seen. About this time we were told via radio that the vehicle was repaired and ready to roll, so we decided to return to the convoy. I was slinging my saw over my shoulder when I noticed my contractor partner was staring at the ruins in horror. He was frozen. I shook him and he snapped out of his stupor, quickly leaving the area with the rest of us. Once we were back at the camp and it was pleasantly daylight the following morning, several of us were chatting about the encounter at Camp Babylon before our daily operations briefing. It was then that I remembered the terrified expression on the face of the contractor. So I asked him about it. He was still obviously traumatized by the event, but managed to explain that as we were leaving our position on the sandy hill, we saw a tall, black figure standing beside the ruins. It was watching us as we were looking for him. He said that he felt an instant wave of despair hit him and thought that he was going to die. 
He didn't remember leaving the area. His next memory was in the Humvee headed back to Kuwait. Now, instances of shadow entities have been reported by many Iraqis and multiple international servicemen across the country. These encounters echo Moorhouse's experiences that had allegedly occurred in Jordan's Batn al-Ghul. Unfortunately, we say allegedly because in an unpublished piece for the Esquire magazine, Jim Schnabel, author of the book Remote Viewers, The Secret History of America's Psychic Spies, states that his tale concerning how he gained the ability to interact with the Jinn of Jordan was just a plagiarization of a story belonging to another remote viewer called Joe McMonagall who had the exact same experience in Europe a decade earlier. Jim Schnabel said the following. Morehouse started working on his own book of his experiences, later titled The Psychic Warrior, inside the CIA Stargate program. The book discusses an accident in Jordan in the mid-1980s, when Morehouse was hit in his helmet by a bullet from a careless Jordanian. At the DTS, a prior name for Project Stargate, Morehouse told colleagues about the incident, but only mentioned that it had only given him a headache afterwards. In Psychic Warrior, however, the trauma from the bullet, we are now told, destabilized his brain and caused him to have a variety of psychic and transcendental experiences. Yet, while Morehouse's Butnil Gould story remains doubtful, that does not mean that this location is free of spectral phenomena. In fact, its very name, Batn al-Ghul, references a Jordanian supernatural legacy that goes back over a thousand years. And as we all show in the next part of this episode, this historic legacy is as violent as its contemporary locations like modern-day Iraq and Palestine, albeit on a smaller scale. We live in the northern part of the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan, where my brother told me about a disturbing event he found himself in one day while he was driving to the city market. He explained his experience to me in great detail, where reality appeared to have shifted around him while he approached the area. It was a typical day in the city, but the unusual phenomena began when he suddenly had a feeling of being detached from his surroundings, and then noticing that the area he was driving through was completely wrong and not what it should be. He didn't feel like he was in his Jordan anymore, but in another dimension or a completely different reality or something. As he parked his car to try and understand what was happening, the noise of the hustle and bustle of the street seemed to fade into the background and this is where his experience took a profoundly more disturbing turn. As he sat there examining the area, he felt the presence of someone else in the car with him. When he turned around, to his astonishment, a transparent figure with undefined features was sitting there with him in his vehicle. He said that this shadow-like entity began speaking to him in a tone tainted with sorrow, saying, Inform everyone that you are on the verge of the end. Life has decreed its demise, and the inevitable is very close. A terrible conflict is approaching and there will be a drought in water resources, and this conflict will impact you and your loved ones. Beware, warn the people, and draw closer to God, for this event is imminent. As proof, the entity then revealed information concerning individuals from my brother's personal life who had passed away, including a close friend of his. The being said that he saw his friend being consumed by a fire and then went on to forewarn him that someone else dear to him who is still alive was in danger and would also soon meet their end. My brother explained to me that this entity spoke for a while with him in the car, providing other details that he now unfortunately cannot remember. But the strange thing is, throughout the entire encounter and despite its terrifying nature, my brother was not afraid of this being nor detected any sense of malice from it. In fact, it was the complete opposite. He felt a flow of positive emotions, genuine tenderness and warmth being generated from it. After it finished speaking, the figure vanished momentarily, returning for a brief moment without uttering a word, but this time relaying to him a sense of deep grief and sadness before disappearing again. 
But despite this, my brother said he was instantly overwhelmed by a feeling of quote unquote nirvana, that being a feeling of perfect peace and contentment. And it was in that moment he returned to our real world. But this weird experience did not end there. When he looked around, he was no longer parked on the side of a busy street. Both him and his car were transported hundreds of kilometers away out into the desert onto a familiar desert road, facing a signboard that read Maan. Maan is on the complete other side of the country, in southern Jordan. Now we have multiple questions. What was this spectral entity? How was he instantly transported across country in less than a second? Did the entity do it? And if so, why that location in particular? Regardless, it's crucial to note that my brother was fully conscious during the whole encounter. He is completely sure he did not hallucinate, dream or imagine the experience. And at the relatively young age of 40, he has a completely sound mind. We are still looking for a scientific answer to explain this situation. Within various traditions, it's believed that the veil, or a barrier between our world and the realms of the supernatural exists. In some traditions, multiple worlds or dimensions consist of the spirits of the dead, while in others, they're home to eldritch-type monstrosities, so Lovecraftian in scale, they can drive the human mind insane. In Islam, however, it's believed that these parallel dimensions merely consist of a form of life known as the aforementioned Jinn. In locations where traumatic events occur, some occultists and experts on the paranormal believe that the veil that separates our world can become thinned or may have already been thinned, allowing other world beings either access to our world or enabling humans to see aspects of their world. Hence, in Iraq, during the darkest times in its modern history, stories about jinn encounters are numerous, or in places where a natural mass casualty event has occurred, such as in Japan in 2011, spectral encounters have often been spoken of. An alternative but complementary theory suggests a concept known as psionic imprinting, where residual energy or emotional impressions are left on a location following a traumatic event. This imprint might manifest as a mere replay of said event, focusing on an individual or animal at the center of that event, giving the impression to anyone observing this manifestation that they're seeing a ghost when in reality they're only witnessing a type of psychic recording. Unfortunately, Neither of these theories, be it a thinning of dimensional barriers or psychic imprinting, have been conclusively proven as a fact. However, for this episode, we'll focus on the theoretical concepts of this thinning of the veil, specifically as it pertains to Batn al -Ghul and why this location in particular is believed to be haunted. But to understand this, we first need to revisit a pivotal time in Jordanian history, May 1918 Originally part of the Ottoman Empire until the end of the First World War, Jordan rests right in the center of the Middle East. Today, its society is stable and its people are friendly and welcoming, mixing the tradition of the Gulf with the culture of the Levant. In other words, the best of both worlds. However, because of its strategic geographic position, Numerous civilizations throughout history have clashed over its sands all the way back to the ancient Achaemenid and Babylonian empires. In 1918, Batn al-Ghul in particular played a key role in the shaping of the modern region when Arab and British forces conducted a raid on a train station established here, during which the garrison who controlled it were eliminated. The station which was a waypoint for a strategic railroad that impacted the entire peninsula, was decimated in the campaign. Before it existed, some people traveling to and from Mecca from neighboring parts of the region and Africa had no choice but to pass through this geographically hostile area composed of steep cliff faces, 
sharp rocks, and sand that was difficult to navigate. Such journeys often led to a loss of life, because not only was the landscape harsh, but anyone from lone individuals to perhaps even entire caravans also ran the risk of being unalive by brutal bandits patrolling the area. These various threats contributed to it earning the name Batn al-Ghul, also known as Belly of the Beast. It's said that those fortunate enough to make Hajj and Umrah pilgrimage, but unfortunately enough to have a travel through here, commonly made the following dua or prayer. May the Almighty God be merciful to them who descend into the belly of the ghoul. However, this threat was not just human and environmental, but also supernatural, as a powerful jinn is believed to haunt the entire valley. As just one of many anomalous entities spoken of in the oral traditions of the Jordanian Bedouin, this entity in particular is described as having the appearance of a cyclops with one eye in the center of her forehead and a hoofed foot resembling that of a donkey or an ostrich. Many have testified to have seen this creature from a distance, while those who have even encountered it directly say it's invulnerable to bullets. According to local tribesmen, it goes by the name of Salewa and British explorers in the early 1900s who surveyed the area for the potential railroad were warned about encountering this being. Even the problematic orientalist and adventurer Charles Montago Doughty in his influential 1888 travel log, Travels in Arabia Deserta, makes several references to this creature as something both native and terrifying to the area. He states that she entices male passengers, calling to them by their names, so that they think it's their own mother's or sister's voice. Although this entity behaves in a manner similar to the skinwalker of the Americas in their ability to read the minds of its victims by mimicking someone from their life, it's also reminiscent of another powerful female entity that was perhaps feared in this area thousands of years earlier, the succubus Lilith. This is a figure from the Mesopotamian and Jewish mythology that in some traditions is theorized to be the first wife of Adam and supposedly a primordial she-demon. Her abilities, like Salewa, includes the ability to shapeshift, mental manipulation and seduction. However, while Lilith seduces men for poor creation, the Austrian orientalist and politician von Kremer wrote that Salewa's main goal is to consume them. Variations of this entity, although apparently native to the deserts of Western Arabia, appears to be a part of species of jinn that routinely appears in the folklores and children's story across the Gulf and even into Northwest Africa and the Southern Mediterranean, where she goes by the name of Aisha Kiandisha, a Moroccan jinn, a dangerous but tragic being we'll examine shortly in future episodes. But why would Salewa, who could possibly be a Mesopotamian entity in origin, choose Batn al-Ghul as its home? Well, as we mentioned earlier, this part of the Arabian Peninsula was part of the Mesopotamian Empire, so it's understandable that remnants of its lore survived into the 19th, 20th and 21st century. And theoretically, that dimensional veil that separates our world may naturally be thin in this area, making it an attractive hunting and in some cases feeding ground for extra-dimensional monsters. But why? In May 2007, a blogger took to the internet addressing a theory that Batn al-Ghul could be situated over a yet-to-be-discovered buried city and that this city could be the source of all the supernatural occurrences reported across the area. This individual, a Timothy Wordsworth, who was an irregular combatant in Iraq, 
addressed a rumor that this lost city was built for the Sumerian entity Inki, a fictional deity from ancient Mesopotamia that is considered as one of the Anunnaki's. The Anunnaki are a collective of supernatural beings belonging to the ancient Sumerians, Akkadians, Assyrians and Babylonians. In addition to being associated with the fallen angels and giants of the Dead Sea Scrolls, as well as technologically advanced aliens and even a race of secretive humanoid reptiles in the modern age. Wordsworth argues that this city is not associated with Inki, since Botnagul is too far removed from Mesopotamia to have that connection, but that it is home to a powerful supernatural force that could even be alien in origin or something far worse. And although his analysis and conclusions are questionable at best, it is here we can piece together from his blog a tenuous explanation for all the high strangeness we have covered in this episode. Wordsworth states that when he camped in Batnagul for two nights, on both nights he dreamt of an eagle telling him that it loved him, but then he also goes on to say that there's a great evil there and that area could be hell itself, implying that a physical gateway to the Abrahamic hell exists beneath this area, possibly due to buried alien technology. Subtly acknowledging how completely and utterly bizarre this all sounds and openly admitting that he is not qualified to speak expertly on Jordanian folklore and history, at least here on the mysterious Middle East, we can see some less than obvious connections, or at least happy coincidence, to a history of anomalous activity in the area that tie in to Woodsworth's experiences. Firstly, he believes that the eagle who spoke seductively to him in his dreams was feminine in nature, echoing the lore concerning Salawa, that horrific jinn that tempts men to their fate with a seductive and appealing voice. Furthermore, the ancient entity Lilith, who may or may not be Salawa, is also believed to enter the dreams of her male victims in order to get what she wants. Even Charles Montago Doty in his travelogue writes that this female shapeshifter has been described in some encounters as taking the appearance of a humanoid bird, possessing a beak instead of a mouth. Secondly, if we are to assume that a weakening of dimensional barriers between our world and other realities naturally exists in Batnul Ghul, or has formed here due to thousands of years of trauma occurring in this vicinity, then it makes sense that not only evil can move through that barrier, but also the good, and even the indifferent, of which Jin can be all three. Hence why that one individual who claimed to have encountered the shadow entity in his car and instantly transported across the country to a road adjacent to Batnagul, said that not once during the lengthy encounter did he feel that he was in danger. Finally, within the broader context of Mesopotamian lore and the Anunnaki, even in the unlikely instance of a Sumerian city deep beneath Jordan ever being found, a definite association between what the ancient Jordanian Arabs and their knowledge of a reptilian influence on earth does seem to exist, at least according to an emerging study. But this is an archaeological mystery we will reserve for upcoming episodes. In the next few episodes, we'll explore the cultural, social and supernatural legacy of the aforementioned Sukkabi type entities across the region as well as digging deeper into mysteries in the Jordanian desert, where archaeologists may have unearthed a potentially horrifying truth to human history and its modern development that may be connected to this thinning of the veil, and a threat the ancient Arabs of the region have been trying to warn us about for centuries. Until then, we apologize for the long break. A mixture of personal and regional events has prevented us from releasing any new content publicly, but now we have a backlog of episodes all set to be released over the coming few months. So please share, check that you're still subscribed, comment on whether you agree or disagree with all that we've said here, and 
See you in the next one.